Mount Anye Ma Chun is an eastern extension of Central Asia's vast Kunlun range. The top of its highest peak is 6,282 meters above sea level. The mountain's roughly 126 square kilometers of glaciers are an important source of water for the Yellow River. As climate change and the retreat of glaciers garner more global attention, so too are herdsmen living at the foot of Mount Anye Ma Chun, starting to pay attention to the snow line and glaciers around them. Tenzin Dagye is leading today's climb and he is followed by two local herdsmen. All of them live in Shuishan Township at the foot of Mount Anye Ma Chun. They measure the glaciers around their grazing lands from May to October every year. With their efforts coordinated by the local government, they've been carrying out such surveys for many years. The idea that ice and snow are as valuable as gold and silver is deeply rooted in local herdsmen's hearts. <laughs> Shuishan Township lies in Ma Chin County of Qinghai Province's Golog Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. Every summer, local herdsmen move their cattle and sheep to summer pastures here at an altitude of 4,800 meters. This black tent covered with snow is where Tenzin Dagye's family live in summer. The water in the brook beside the pasture is from snow and ice melting on Mount Anye Ma Chun. Before taking water, Tenzin Dagye ritually offers it to Buddhas and all living creatures. For Tenzin Dagye's wife, morning is the busiest time of the day. Today, it's the weekend. Her eldest son, who is attending primary school in the county town, is home. 
He's 10 years old and can give a hand tending the sheep and cattle. <laughs> the couple also have a preschool daughter and a baby son. <laughs> When his children are home, Tenzin Dagye takes time to tell them about local wild plants, birds and animals. <laughs> Older villagers often take the children to pray for trees, grass and water, hoping to teach them the value of protecting and coexisting harmoniously with Mother Nature at their very young age. Adults place wool on the grassland beside the brook, hoping their wishes will bloom here like flowers. After dinner, Tenzin Dagye prepares the equipment and materials needed for the next day's glacier survey. His children gather around him because they know there are many interesting videos and pictures on his computer. <laughs> <laughs> Batang Township in Yushu, Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture, is in the border area of Qinghai, Sichuan, and Tibet. The Yangtze River flows into the Batang River here. There are mountains, grasslands, forests, lakes, and other landforms here. With an average altitude of nearly 4,000 meters, the area is home to many wild animals. Batang Township has a population of about 10,000. Animal husbandry here is the main means of livelihood. Locals coexist harmoniously with wild animals. Men and wild species keep a respectful distance from each other most of the time. Sometimes, however, a Tibetan blue bear will enter the village. The stray dogs in Xiangu village are the first to spot the bear. The bear's target is this food bucket filled with scraps for stray animals. <coughs> Tibetan blue bears are strong and tough. They are the most ferocious animals on the plateau. This one has no reason to fear the dogs. Harassed by their barking, it tries to scare them away.
Tibetan blue bears are primarily carnivorous, although like this one, they will still eat wheat-based scraps and leftovers in the bucket. Sensing the power of the giant animal, the stray dogs keep clear. The most they can do is bark at it until it has left after eating its fill. After hearing that a bear came to the village to look for food, the villagers replenished the food bucket for stray animals. This, of course, will encourage bears to return. This sow even comes together with her two cubs. Bear cubs are usually born in January and February and weaned in June of the same year. The cubs are frightened by the angry dogs. They stay close to their mother for protection. The cubs try to eat from the bucket several times, but scared by the barking dogs, they have to step back. Preoccupied with eating, their mother doesn't pay any attention to them. The cubs haven't eaten much, even when their mother has finished all the food in the bucket and is about to leave. Sanjeng Yuan means source of three rivers in Chinese. The area contains the headwaters of three great rivers, the Yangtze, the Yellow, and the Lanzang. Locals here have a culture of protecting wild animals. Wild animals often enter villages without fear. Himalayan blue sheep can be seen licking salt from the surface of highways and boundary posts. Black-necked cranes, bar-headed geese and other waterfowl caught and build their nests near village houses. In late March, bar-headed geese fly over the Himalayas to return to San Zheng Yuan for the summer. After courtship, they pair off to build nests and lay eggs. Their favored environment for rearing their young is untraversed lakeside or on cliffs. These bar-headed geese have built nests on the cliff across the highway from the lake. The structure of their nests is simple. This one is in a stone cave, which is perfect shelter from the wind and rain. Although it is too small to accommodate two adult bar-headed geese. The female bird will incubate her eggs here. While she is doing this, the male bird will be on guard to prevent her from being disturbed. Another couple, meanwhile, has also found its perfect spot. The female bird is inside incubating her eggs. The male has to intervene to drive away intruders. Birds who have arrived late must make do with leftover, less ideal nesting spots. Incubation lasts 28 to 30 days. During this time, female birds pull out their down feathers to line the nest with and keep their eggs warm. To make sure all the eggs are warmed evenly, they turn them from time to time, varying the side that is closest to their body. With their chicks old enough, the family that arrived later has moved out of their nesting place sometime in May. 
This couple have successfully hatched four chicks and they are now ready to go. To get to the lake, they must first cross the highway. The newborns cannot yet fly. They are unsteady on their feet and vehicles on the road spell peril. After repeated advances and retreats, the family finally crosses the highway to reach the lake. Luckily, there are no big waves in spite of the water's rapid flow, and there are no predators to threaten them either. Soon the chicks are comfortable enough in the water to follow their parents away from the shore. Highways now connect the Qinghai Tibet Plateau to the rest of China, linking its vast areas of wilderness to civilization. Modern roads now run through wetlands, grasslands, and forests. It seems as if there are no inaccessible regions in the world anymore. This is the Wu Dao Liang section of the Qinghai Tibet Highway located in the interior of the northeastern plateau region of Ho Xil. Built in the 1950s, it's a lifeline of material supplies. Even today, it's still the busiest highway on the plateau. Wu Dao Liang is home to many wild animals. Tibetan antelopes pass through here on their long annual migrations. Standing by the highway, tourists who are here for the first time are excited to see these majestic beasts. Every summer, an important task of the Wu Dao Liang Conservation Station in Ho Xil is to teach tourists about its work. Tongot 回去给你们的朋友们也说一下啊，骑车的这些朋友们知道，下次就不要犯这种相同的错误啊。路边而且都有警示，还不让下来啊。谢谢啊。In July, the annual breeding season of Tibetan antelopes is nearing its end. Female antelopes start to leave Zonag Lake with their newborn calves. Later in the month, 
herds of antelopes begin to arrive near Wu Daoliang. To ensure the safe passage of Tibetan antelopes across the Qinghai Tibet Highway, rangers of the Wu Daoliang Conservation Station patrol the road day and night. When a herd of antelopes is approaching the road, they will estimate its time of arrival at the road, then implement temporary traffic control. Two long lines of vehicles stretch along the Qinghai Tibet Highway in either direction. The drivers are waiting patiently as the antelopes move towards the highway, slowly and with care. The herd has approached the road many times, only to hesitate and turn back. Half an hour has passed, but the Tibetan antelopes, which can run at more than 80 kilometers per hour, have still not crossed the 10 meter wide Qinghai Tibet Highway. While the herd is wavering, drivers and tourists start to get agitated. At an altitude of 4,500 meters, Wu Daoliang is considered one of the most difficult sections of the Qinghai Tibet Highway. A lack of oxygen in the air can easily trigger altitude sickness. For the rangers, the safe migration of Tibetan antelopes needs to be guaranteed. At the same time, however, the safety of the drivers and tourists cannot be ignored. After multiple approaches, the leading antelope decides to give it a go. A few newborn calves then also step onto the asphalt road, seemingly in a daze. Then the whole herd follows. The leading antelope, which has managed to cross the road, has for some reason stopped. This causes the animals that were following to turn around and return to the other side. The scene is repeated a few times before all the antelopes finally cross the road. The drivers can now restart their vehicles and continue on to their destinations. Safely across, meanwhile, the Tibetan antelopes can also continue on their migration journey. After crossing the Qinghai Tibet Highway from Wu Daoliang, one kilometer to the east, the antelopes arrive at the Wu Daoliang North Bridge of the Qinghai Tibet Railway. The Qinghai Tibet Railway is the highest railway in the world. It's also the longest railway through a permafrost region. A challenge facing the railway's designers was the need to allow for the crossing of animals. To this end, a variety of different wildlife crossing passages were built along its route. Now comes the test to see if the antelope herd will make use of the passage here and cross under the railway safely.
After initially being intimidated by the roar of the train, the antelopes muster courage. Finally, the herd of Tibetan antelopes follows their leader to pass under the railway bridge. Years have passed since the railway was completed, so no doubt the location of the migratory passage is now imprinted in their memories. The month of July is high season for wildlife activity in and around the Qinghai Lake, which has a surface area of more than 4,500 square kilometers. It's a concentrated habitat and breeding ground of water birds. Every summer, the islands in the lake present a spectacular sight, with countless eggs and nestlings everywhere. But the mouths of tributaries flowing into the lake meanwhile hundreds of thousands of Przewalski's naked carps swim upstream against the current to migrate to fresh water and lay their eggs. And in meadows near the lake shore the carving season of Przewalski's gazelles has also arrived. This is a rare species that is only found around Qinghai Lake and its wild population was once less than 300. Fortunately, more than a decade of unremitting conservation efforts has increased that number to over 3,000. Wu Yong Ling, who works at the South Bank Protection Station of Qinghai Lake, has been in his job for two decades, more than enough to witness the change. On the first day of July, the Forest Public Security Bureau of Haiyang County receives a call from a villager who has found a newborn Przewalski's gazelle and wishes to transfer it to a government agency for feeding. Such occurrences are common during the peak of the Przewalski's gazelle's calving season. At less than a week old, the gazelle calf is weak and vulnerable. Its mother is missing. She may have died because of birth complications or perhaps been killed by wolves.
，十三以后他吃不上奶，身体呢非常的虚弱，所以呢牧民到这家里以后给我们打电话，七月一号救护到救护中心的。正好是七一建党节，我们给他起了个名字呢，叫七一。The South Bank Protection Station of Qinghai Lake, where Wu Yonglin works, is the successor of the original Przewalski's Gazelle Rescue Center. It has a meadow area of about 20 square kilometers, set aside specifically for the rescue of Przewalski's gazelles. Now there are more than 70 Przewalski's gazelles here. Some of them were rescued from the wild, and some were born in captivity. The救护中心被以外的恢复准确数量的人都有很多的工作。从外面救护了大概有一百多只烧成的十三个个体。到一八年的时候呢，我们救护中心呢通过人工驯养繁殖，将近五十只，达到一定的数量以后呢，我们进
看看，舒服了没？啊，哎呦哎，嗯，我们把这个两只，一只驯养到两岁以后，再放到那个大的种群，因为现在它们气味不一样，其他的母羊和公羊会攻击它们，所以两年以后我们跟其他的母羊、公羊合群以后呢，进行自然生活规律，啊，自然交配。In addition to taking good care of newly arrived calves in the station, Wu Yonglin also has to supply the station with water. Especially in winter when rivers freeze, the more than 70 animals in the station rely entirely on him for this. Every day when Wu Yonglin patrols, he counts all the Brzezwalski's gazelles there and records their physical characteristics and behavioral changes. During the calving season in summer, he stays with the does that are waiting to give birth and prepares to deliver their young. At this time of year, he stays in the station for two whole months, living on instant noodles. The former soldier, who once defended his country with his guns, is now the guardian of Przewalski's gazelles. I wake up in the morning at 5 o'clock, take a shower, 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 Wushu 结婚等等，这一方面子，我可以补回来。但是呢，我救助回来的，我看着他们生下来的，看着他们一天一天天的长大的，这些普世员呢，我离不开。这些老朋友，我会一定回来会看望他们。野生动物呢，是人类最好的一种。不会说话的一种朋友